With this brief introduction, let me introduce and invite Dr. Kevin Quickly to introduce our speakers and his background. Mr. Quickly. Isak, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming tonight. And again, Scott, thank you for the hospitality of uh, being in this uh, wonderful spot. Uh, Isak and Roslyn and other members of the Wyndham World Affairs Council um, board, including our own Jennifer Giroux. Really great to uh, work with you on this series. Uh, the goals of this series was really quite simple, and it's part of an objective of trying to find ways to bring the world to our tiny uh, college on a hilltop in southern Vermont. And, and, and uh, substantively, the objective was really to try and cast some light on important topics in international affairs, international relations, that have not gotten a lot of attention, uh, such as the topic we're going to talk about tonight. So Isak mentioned this is the third in the series. Uh, we did, uh, unfortunately, and my apologies for that, have to cancel uh, the, the public lecture last week because our speaker took ill and could not travel. Fortunately for the students, uh, she was able to Skype in, uh, so we had class. And this uh, event is really tripartite. Uh, our speaker meets with the students in class. Uh, they give us a couple of things to read, which we discuss. Uh, we then go to the dining hall and continue our discussion as we do traveling up and down uh, the hill. And, and then an important part of, of our program is to uh, come and join with the Wyndham World Affairs Council. We're very fortunate to have that collaboration and to have a community of people who care about issues uh, uh, outside of our towns and communities. Uh, and uh, we're very fortunate to have people like Dr. Joel Rosenthal, who is the president of the Carnegie uh, Council of Ethics and International Affairs, one of the Andrew Carnegie legacy institutions like the Carnegie Corporation, a grant-making institution, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a, a think tank, uh, and the Carnegie Council. Uh, there used to be the Carnegie Council on Teaching, which has morphed into a new incarnation. But many of these institutions, and ESOC, as you said very well, are, are, are aimed to try and, and develop a more peaceful world. And, and that uh, it very much underlies a lot of the work that Joel uh, has done. Joel has worked at the uh, Carnegie Council for almost a couple of decades. I think we probably met a couple of decades ago. Uh, and uh, after being educated at Harvard and Yale, uh, Joel has developed a real expertise around the issues of ethics and international affairs. I won't steal his thunder, but I think he has a really helpful framework that lets us think about this issue of how to have a robust system of ethics in a, in a connected world. So, uh, Joel, it's really a pleasure to have you with us, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosenthal. Kevin, thank you very much. The pleasure is mine. Um, I've had the opportunity to be here for the afternoon and now evening. Uh, to go up the hill and spend time with students um, at Marlboro College. I think, Kevin, what you're doing at the college is so important. Um, and it's not just a small part of the world, it's a really important part of the world. Um, the center of its own universe, I can see, uh, in the best possible way. I think, oh, I need to switch the mic up. <laughs> we want to get all these compliments. Uh, and record it. Thank you. Uh, no, I think what you're doing at Marlboro is so important. I was very taken with the um, self-directed and self-governed aspects uh, of the college. The, um, the importance of the individual uh, placed in the center of learning, I think it can't be uh, 
underestimated, and I, I just want to uh, congratulate you on what you've accomplished there. Um, I also want to thank you all for coming out um, for this talk. Um, ethics in international affairs can be an uphill topic. Uh, in fact, some people would wonder whether there is such a thing. Uh, and the fact that you're here, that you have voted with your feet, uh, means there must be something to it. So let me um, try to say something um, both definitive and provocative in about 20 minutes. It's going to be wildly ambitious, um, but I just want you to feel like there's something here to, to contend with. Um, let me just start by talking a little bit about ethics. Okay, Just a word on ethics. What do, you, what do I mean by ethics? Ethics is a question. How should we live? It's, it's not something that is um, decided in one instance uh, for all time. It's a process. It's this constant process of asking ourselves how we should live. What values do we care about? What standards do we hold? So Kevin mentioned that I'm representing a Carnegie institution, and I thought what I might do to, to draw you in is to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing at the Carnegie Council and how it fits in with the Carnegie legacy. So Andrew Carnegie um, was uh, a very important philanthropist um, of, of about 100 years ago, so set your clock back about 100 years. And the best way to think about Andrew Carnegie is think Bill Gates. He had the same profile as Bill Gates. He had made a great fortune in business. He was known as the richest man in the world. He decided to spend the last part of his life on philanthropy. And he had a very strong sense of what philanthropy would be. Philanthropy was to think about better ways of living, better systems, better institutions, a more peaceful world. He had two big ideas. And his ideas were ethics-based. His first idea was education. There could be nothing. So anyway, the, the first idea was education. We could do better in terms of how we're educating people. He had a very simple idea. The way to, to educate people is to create a new system, and that new system was public libraries. Somebody knows, right? He built 2,500, 2,500 libraries all across the continent of the United States. The idea being that what could be more important than making education accessible and available to every citizen? Okay? But the main thing here is systems change. Right? We have to change the system in which we live. Um, his second idea was peace. So peace sort of has this idea of, you know, uh, you know very idealistic uh, dreamer or whatever. Carnegie was a hard businessman. He had a real plan for peace. And that plan for peace was what we now refer to as international law and organization. It's, a, it's the sense of international law. He built the peace palace at The Hague. He lobbied to have the great powers sign treaties of arbitration. So if they had conflicts, they would bring them to a court and we would set up a League of Nations, a very practical scheme for peace. And he wanted to, and he used his philanthropy to fund these ideas. And the idea I want to, to you to take away from here is what social scientists or political scientists would call normative shift. What do I mean by normative shift? Normative shift is when one thing is um, considered um, OK, and then it's considered not OK. Right? The norm changes. Right? So Carnegie used to like to use the example of slavery. Right? So that you know, we, we, we used to think that slavery was a, a human practice that was accepted for centuries. And then all of a sudden, within his lifetime, it was not OK. Right? We don't do this anymore. With conflict, he, used the, um, he loved to use the example of dueling. Right? It used to be if two gentlemen had a, had a dispute about their boundary of their uh, two plantations or whatever, you know, they would, ha would have a duel, right? We don't do that anymore. We take it to court. So he believed that these normative shifts change and that the shift in terms of, of, of peace was actually self-evident, that this was going to happen. Why? Because we have moved into an industrial age. We've moved into the machine age. We now have a way to kill people using machines. 
the idea of an industrial war was crazy. People wouldn't do that anymore, and so we'll have to build a mechanism to do that. So World War I, and then subsequent things happen. We can talk about that, if you wish, in the Q&A, but you get a sense of the ethos behind it. So let me fast forward to today. Where are we today? Carnegie believed that the world was globalizing or internationalizing 100 plus years ago. Um, he was right in certain ways, wrong in others. But where are we today? And I want to suggest that there are two stories um, that, um, at least in my lifetime, um, have changed very much. I think we're in the middle of a, of a, of a narrative shift, if not a narrative collapse, right? A narrative is the story that we tell ourselves about the world that we're living in, okay? So very quickly, the two narrative shifts that we see right now, the first one is with regard to democracy. Again, for me growing up, there was sort of this self-evident acceptance of what democracy is, and it was sort of a self-evident good, right? Um, we, we had the, the, the Cold War period, the post-Cold War period, where the principles of liberal democracy seem pretty solid. I think we're moving through a period right now where there's some question about that. I'll just give you one citation to make this point. Um, Journal of Democracy, edited by Larry Diamond. Um, there were some surveys that were reported in the Journal of Democracy about millennials, Americans, um, aged 40 or younger, uh, in terms of their attitudes towards democracy. One question was phrased, is it essential to live in a democracy? Is it essential to live in a democracy? Only 30% said yes, it is essential to live in democracy, which means roughly 70% either don't know or don't care or maybe think democracy is not, not working. I don't know, we could discuss that. Um, there are other challenges to democracy that we see in the rise of populism and authoritarianism around the world. We all know about uh, Vladimir Putin, um, Erdogan, Orban, Duterte, others, right? So that's happening. So the narrative about democracy is, in some, some, is of some concern to me. The other narrative that was sort of self-evident through the Cold War and after was the narrative of internationalism, going back to Carnegie, right? There was a certain kind of assumption that there would be some kind of global mechanism to coordinate global responses to global challenges. And um, you all know this story. It begins probably with Brexit, um, goes on to America first. Um, and we see the rising fences all around the world in response to the migration problem and so on. So you see a real challenge to this, to this notion of, of internationalism. I had a whole long list. You probably know it better than I do, just from an American perspective, whether it's you know, NATO um, you know, called into some question, or international agreements like the Paris Climate Accord or the Iran deal, um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, all of these arrangements that were meant to promote some kind of peaceful, cooperative global order that was meant to ensure prosperity for Americans and for others have now been called into question. So we have two stories that are in some trouble right now. The democracy story, the internationalism story. So if you are sort of, um, if you come from where I come from, this is, this is of, great, of great concern. So what is, it, what is this world that we're living in now? And I want to make a strong case that we're living, that, that the story right now that we're living through and we need to figure out how to respond to is this idea of a connected world. And I come to this story, I'm going to relate to you a conversation that I was fortunate enough to have with the former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown. In, in my conversation with him, um, the prime minister said, I was prime minister for three years, roughly three years, 2007 to 2010. And there were four big issues that crossed my desk as a national leader of a great power. The first issue, if you think of the time frame, 2008, the global financial crisis, right? 
It's a big one. Nothing else matters. When you're prime minister, real time, the country's going down the drain, right? His point, his simple point to me was this. I could call the chancellor of the exchequer, find out how things are going over at the, the treasury, right? I can call the chairman of the Bank of England, the Royal Bank of Scotland, et cetera. Everything's fine, sir. We're all good. That's not where the problem was. The problem was in New York. It was in Hong Kong. It was in the, the, the global system, right? So as a national leader, my job was to face outward, not inward. I had, that, that was my, my job, right? In, in the interests of my citizens. The second, the second issue was security. Again, think back to that time frame. Basically, the big challenge for security was Al-Qaeda and other terrorist um, challenges. Okay, Scotland Yard, everything's fine, sir. You know, our, you know, our borders are secure. Heathrow Airport's great, whatever. Um, British military, that's fine. But his point was Iraq, Afghanistan, global terror networks, if we're not networked in, in terms of intelligence and security with Europe, the United States, and our allies, there's no way that we're providing security for the United Kingdom. This is, a, this is an international effort, okay? Third issue, um, I'm preparing for the climate summit um, in 2009 in Copenhagen, right? This was the predecessor to the Paris um, climate summit. Um, and if you can remember back to 09, it was a very big deal. The entire world is coming to Copenhagen to discuss climate change and what can be done about it. And he said, you know, I'm looking at my national policy. Our national policy is great. We're, we're proud of the United Kingdom. You know, our carbon emissions are in the right direction. We're doing the right things. That's great. But in the interest of my citizens, we're a nation of 65 million people. There are 7 billion people on the planet. We could have the best climate policy in the world, and you know what? If we're not having an influence or an impact on the rest of the, the world, it doesn't matter. Last one, <clears throat> and this was of particular interest to, to Gordon Brown, is poverty, global poverty. Again, getting back to that idea that we're living in a planet of 7 billion people with many, a uh, couple billion under um, poverty lines and so on. So what are, what are we going to do in terms of the global poverty problem? Um, United Kingdom, we have great overseas development policies. We're doing a lot um, with, our, um, with our overseas aid and relief and so on. But again, um, without a coordinated effort um, with Europe, the United States, and the, the developed world, um, what, what the United Kingdom does is, is a drop in the bucket. So he persuaded me in this, in this conversation that I don't care who you are or where you are, if you could be in the most isolated place, um, uh, you could be in a country surrounded by fences or whatever, we are living in a, in a connected world, okay? Um, and the, the examples that I'm going to give you now will just, will just ratchet that up in terms of what's happened in the last 10 years. So the point is, we live in a connected world. How are we going to, to respond to it? And my, my, my simple point to you is that there needs to be a response that has ethics, values, principles that are generated by democratic publics to weigh into how these, these issues will be shaped, informed. And they're quite profound. And there's no escape from any of these issues that I'm about to, to give to you, okay? So quickly, because I want to have conversation, I'm going to give you th three categories and two examples in each, and then I'm going to quit, because I really want to hear from you. <gasps> the connected world, think about it in three ways. The natural world, the virtual world, and the political world. Natural world, virtual world, political world. So the natural world, and this is an, an area that I only know a little bit about, but I can recognize how profound that it is from an ethics perspective, from a humanistic perspective, for a future perspective, for a peace perspective. And that is probably the biggest revolution that we've lived through um, in our lifetimes is the genetic 
revolution, the genome. Right? We now have the capacity to alter life. We can alter, when I say we, this is actually we. I mean globally, this is actually, um, the more I'm learning about this, the more terrifying it is because it's actually not that difficult to do. This technology is not nuclear technology. It's actually quite simple technology. Um, we can alter plant life, we can alter animal life, and we can alter human life. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I can get into this. I'm going to try hard to just say a few things about it. And let me just talk about the human question for a minute. Some of you may know, um, I know there's going to be a talk here about Chinese medicine, right? So this is an international relations problem because um, famously now, if you're paying attention, there's a famous case in China of a doctor who has now altered the genetic makeup of a human embryo in China, okay, against most ethical or normative standards, okay? Um, this raises an enormous question about values, norms, regulation, perhaps even law, is it going to be any kind of coordinating mechanism for how these technologies will be used? Just briefly on the genetics issue, there are, there are various ways to draw lines. I'll just give you one. Um, you know, one is to think about using genetic en editing or engineering for therapies, right? Think about turning off a gene that will um, perhaps um, stop a disease versus actually altering a gene, right? That will um, lead to enhancement, right? To lead to some other outcome. We can talk about that in the Q and A, but there are various different ways to to think about the ethics of this. But again, I to get this to the global scale, there's, this is an ungoverned space, right? Ethics will play a role in how these things are governed. Again, in the natural world, another example that's inescapable is climate, of course, right? How many of you have heard of the term of geoengineering? Just heard the term. Okay, two years ago, I had never heard about it. When I heard about it, I was terrified, thought it was crazy, sounded like science fiction, and the more I hear about it, the more I understand that it's, 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 it's actually close to being present in our lives. So geoengineering means engineering the climate, if the climate is warming, there are technologies available to cool it, right? And if you believe that um, we will not, the human community will not be able to um, keep emissions down so that we don't rise to more than 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees centigrade, um, many people from the climate community, climate activist community, believe that these technologies to cool the climate will be reached for and perhaps used. Right? Two technologies. One is carbon sequestration, which means taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, the other is solar radiation management, which is to deflect solar rays away. Right? Obvious ethics questions about human intervention into nature. Do we play God? What are the unintended consequences? What are the risks? Who's responsible? Who controls the global thermostat? Right? How is this area going to be governed? This, you can't escape. This is going to happen. This, is going to, this, this question is going to come up. And you can say, I don't, you know, I don't want to deal with it. Well, it's here. Okay, that's the natural world. Okay. Virtual world. If we go back to Andrew Carnegie days, the virtual world is actually the one area that if you tried to explain this to somebody from 100 years ago, they wouldn't understand what you're talking about, right? That, that's how much this is really changing. You all know how fast it's I don't think we realize the velocity of what we're in the middle of. But let me just give you two examples of the virtual world. The first one is the one that's most discussed, which is artificial intelligence, right? The idea that machines are becoming more and more capable of decision making. I'm just going to focus on that for a second, the decision-making capacity of machines. Henry Kissinger, of all people. Okay, this, is, this is now an international relations issue because Henry Kissinger, 95 years old, has written an article for Atlantic Magazine about this, about artificial intelligence and what it's going to mean for the world. Right? And it's what it's going to mean for world politics what it's going to mean for human society. 
The title of it tells you everything you need to know. The title of the article is How the Enlightenment Ends. Well, what's the Enlightenment about? The Enlightenment is about human reason. It's about the idea that that we have within our capacity, the, our rational capacity to, to decide how we live, right? The Enlightenment, before that it was all divine, it just comes from God, right? It comes from up there, right? Now it's, you know, the Enlightenment, it's, and, and now the Enlightenment, we, we, we believe we're living in the Enlightenment world, but are we going to something else? And Yuval Harari, who's written some books about um, sort of future, um, uh, future human society and where we're going. Some of you may know the Harari books. Um, he's very popular. And he has this great image. He says, you know, authority used to rest, you know, in the cloud, meaning God, right? Then it goes to, to, the, human, to the human brain, and now it's going back up to the cloud again, right? The idea that, that you know, that, that's where it's all going to happen. So, so, you know, Henry Kissinger is worried that, you know, we're giving up decision-making to, to machines, so here's a place where ethics is, is already intervened in one little example. There is a global campaign to, for the banning of autonomous lethal weapons. The idea being that there are now weapon systems that run on artificial intelligence. So in other words, there's a, like a drone that has programmed in it you know, with weapons and so on, and then you let the drone go and then it decides. And the idea being that, um, so the, 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 the people behind this ban are saying that these, these should be banned, that we shouldn't have any machines that can actually make the decision to take human life, that that's a place to draw a line. So that's AI. The other one I'll just say a word about um, on, on the virtual world is, is cyber. And I defy any of you, regardless of age, cyber is in your life. <laughs> You, you, there's, there's no escaping it. it, and it's very personal to all of us, our devices, right? And um, I noticed um, the idea being, um, this is coming from Brad Smith of Microsoft Corporation. He said, you know what, we have to do something to protect people in cyber. We're all potential victims of cyber attack. Okay, just check your spam folder, right? <laughs> and so he has come up with this idea of, um, he calls it a digital Geneva Convention, right? That not only countries, but companies like Microsoft should sign. And the idea being that we're all innocent civilians. And just like the Geneva Conventions against, for warfare protects people, protects non-combatants, right? That that's the, that's the ethical principle, that there should be the same principle in the cyber world. And that the powerful actors, nation states and, and businesses should sign and they should, they should pledge. The way he phrases it is great. He says, 100% defense, 0% offense. Meaning any products or anything that we do should go to the protection of the consumer and the innocent person, right? And none of our efforts should go towards you know, helping in any kind of cyber attack whether it's a net, whether it's waged by a nation or by a criminal or a criminal gang. So it's very, very interesting, the sort of digital Geneva Convention, the idea that cyber is now its own world and that it needs norms, standards, protections. Okay. So last one, and then I'm going to stop, is the political world. And um, this is, again, unavoidable. And I'll just give you two examples, and you probably have many, many more. But um, I, I can't get up here and talk about ethics for a connected world without mentioning the migration problem, right? The migration challenge. Um, I think in 2018, um, the um, UN agency um, for refugees, uh, so, I'm sorry? No, I mean, High Commission. Uh, anyway, the numbers of, uh, I think it's called global forced migration. The numbers are, you know, high six, 68 million, something like that, just for one year, right? So you all know this, the, the idea of forced migration, whether it's economic um, or political or asylum seeking and so on. Um, we all know what's happening on the southern border. We all know what's happening in Europe, but this is obviously a, a big global concern. And there needs to be more coordinated 
This is a global scale problem that will require a global scale solution that will require some principles. I ran across one great example of the kind of work that's being done needs to be done. It's probably just preparatory work in advance of the politics that needs to be done. But uh, a scholar named Michael Doyle at Columbia University has assembled a couple of hundred experts and they've put together something called the International Mobility Convention, right? And the idea being a set of rules, norms, guidelines, practical things that can be developed. I'll, I can talk about it in the Q&A if you're interested. To, to have a globally coordinated effort to deal with global forced migration, right? We can put up fences for a particular period of time, but um, this is a problem that isn't going away and will require global coordination. And there are some ethical principles at stake in how we decide on what that coordinating mechanism will be. And then lastly, anytime I have an opportunity to talk to an audience, I, I raise this issue because I fear that it's not getting the attention that it deserves uh, and that we still live in a world with um, many tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. Um, we do have a nonproliferation regime. Um, there is, in principle, uh, uh, something in place to, 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 to move to a, 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 um, a safer world. And uh, one of my fears is that it's um, pushed too much to the side. Uh, we were talking uh, with, um, up at the college today about education and the importance of education. I worry deeply about what young people have learned about nuclear weapons, um, what they know about it, what their level of concern is about it. I think it's something that needs to be, um, you know, um, high on high on the list. Um, there is a, um, a there are a couple of initiatives that I think are very important. There's a nuclear threat initiative, um, and um, which was started I think by um, actually senior statespeople who were actually very instrumental in the Cold War, and they've looked closely and they understand the real dangers. People like Senator Sam Nunn, um, Secretary of Defense William Perry, um, and they are passionate about. Um, reduction, um, and they actually have helped to start a, a movement called Global Zero. Uh, Global Zero is an, actually an international campaign, which is leading, trying to get to the number zero. Okay, we can talk about whether that's feasible or even desirable, but the point of the people in that campaign is that we're so far away from the. We need to establish direction, and there's something about zero that focuses the mind, and we need to go that way instead of the other way. There are some sources of optimism. Um, I had some statistics, but it was something like, at the end of the Cold War, there was something like 70,000 nuclear warheads. And I think today we have something like 15,000 nuclear warheads. I mean, there has been drastic reduction. And the question is, can we go, can we go lower? Obviously, an a moral and ethical dimension to, to that issue now. So I'll close with um, a question for you, um, which is, where is the narrative now? How, how do we think about rewriting a narrative that, that addresses the connected world that we live in? With everything seeming to be going in the other direction, um, how do we do that? My suggestion is that the, uh, the answer is actually um, is within realism itself, which is um, all of these issues are not some, it, it goes back to Mr. Carnegie's vision of peace, which was very practical and very, very action oriented, right? It, it, was, it was a beautiful idea, but it wasn't about the beautiful idea, it was about what we can do. Each one of those areas, if you look at it, is a functional area which will develop, which will need guidance, which will need norms, regulation, and so on. Um, and those things need to be worked at. And so the question is, where is that going to come from? And where, how are we going to be able to, to rewrite that narrative? And my sense is that it does go back to, um, to this idea of democracy. I think it goes back to people standing up and saying these are the values that matter to us. Um, and, that we, and we expect and hold accountable our, our leaders in our institutions um, to, to, to stand for that. But I'm actually more interested in, in your views in terms of where we are what we can do. I went on a little bit too long, but thank you. You've been a great patient audience. Thanks. So how do we do this? Is it um, people raise their hands or? Uh, Please, any yeah. Raise hands. 
We have to have fun. Okay. And hey, please, uh, you know, it just doesn't have to be press conference. If you want to just make a comment or, yeah. Um, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the first um, of your three tripartite, and that's the natural. Mm -hmm. In three weeks, the Sunday after uh, Easter, I'm going to be doing a six-week sermon series on the environment. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, I wanted to cheat a little bit and say, what would you like my congregation to hear in three weeks in regards to the environment? The only assumption um, that, that I'll convey to you is one of the things I'd like to do is to persuade my congregation that the environment um, or that the environment is not a political issue per se, but it is a theological issue mm -hmm. and therefore an ethical issue. Um, so what would you say in regards to ethics, which I can translate into theology, about the environment that you would like 100 or 200 people to hear? Wow, that's a great, a great question. I'll give you two, two points. <laughs> this is great. I'm getting to write a sermon. This is amazing. These two points will be in it. So we talked a little bit about this in our class discussion today. I, I think that um, the way I, the way I look at it um, from a practical perspective is that there's there's two things um, that are important. Two elements. Um, and I'll give you just a little tiny vignette because when people think about ethics, and I'm sorry I'm going to repeat something I mentioned today, but it's, it's a short little vignette because when people think about ethics, <clears throat> they think about a classic ethics problem. Okay. The classic ethics problem is my mother is sick. She needs medicine. I can't afford the medicine. So I'm going to, can I steal the medicine from the pharmacy and they won't even know it's gone. And so we discuss that. Okay. Um, so there's, so one is that, that decision-making process, but there's another way to look at that question from an ethics perspective, and that is you can ask a question, why do I live in a community where um, sick people don't get medicine? The point I'm trying to make here is ethics is about two things. It's about human agency, and it's about our own decision-making process and what we do, and that matters. Right? But that's not everything. We live in systems. We live in communities, and, and I think when you look at the environmental issue, it's helpful for people to think about both things. Okay, what, what do I do? Who do I want to be? What's important that, that, that I have agency in some way, and I act a certain way, but also that, you know, that I can have some effect in terms of maybe I can't change the system, but, but that's also a responsibility as well, the system that I'm living in. So that's one point. The other point I would make is, um, from a more theological perspective, I guess, is the, um, it's, you know, I guess it's, it's self-evident, but it needs to be underlined is the idea of stewardship. You know, the idea is that it's, you know, we're just passing through, you know, it's not, we're, the, the, the idea of stewardship is, is, is a concept. In other words, you know, we have, a, we have a relationship with the environment and it is, it's our obligation or responsibility to maintain it for those who come after us, right? Um, we benefited from what came before us. Um, we have an obligation to, for what comes after us, right? So a simple point, but, um, you know, we do have some obligations to the future generation. Last point on this, I don't know whether it's, it's sermon worthy, but you know, my, my, my own view of some of some of you know, everything's gotten so polarized and politicized around the issue is sometimes when I think about the, the environment, um, I just think about clean air and clean water. <laughs> you know, what, what, what can we do to, I mean, and that's just, a, again, a self-evident good and that we should be working toward, toward that in a very kind of simple way. Yeah. yeah. And I want to add one more thing to you. Uh, you will get a letter from me uh, about that issue of environment. 
and this is based on the discussion I had with our town manager, how we can reduce the pollution in our roads. There are hundreds and thousands of bottles and cans thrown out of the car into the road. Mm -hmm. Although there is a law against it, $250 fine if they can find you, but who can find them when people are drinking, half drunk, and so on. This is what he told me to have all the church and all the temples and every religious to teach their people to educate their family members not to pollute the environment. Use waste basket to get rid of your cans, bottles, when you can instead of throwing it in the road. You will get a letter from me in more detail. Any other question, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, please. Yes. All right. Uh, hello? Okay. I can't even hear. Anyway, um, you know, the, the, the main thing you keep, the, the, the sort of basic word here is connected, mm -hmm. right? And it seems that it's very, it's easy for some people to see that we are all connected. And it's very difficult for other people to see that we are connected at all. Um, uh, personally, I, because I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I have an experience of connectivity that someone who has lived in a, in a small town anywhere in this country and never been out of it doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. So how, how is that going to change? That's my, how, how can this connectivity, um, it, without, without people sort of moving out of their sphere in which they were born, I, anyway, I don't know exactly what I'm saying here, but connect to, you know, to get connected is really the key, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have an, an easy answer for that, but I think it's a profound and important point. It goes to consciousness, it goes to identity, and it goes to most, most importantly, I'm glad you mentioned your own experience, lived experience. Um, you know, so much of ethics really does come out of that, right? You, you have your own lived experience and you form your ideas out of that. And, um, and again, this, I apologize in advance because this will sound perhaps too, too simple or too cliche, but I think the answer is at some level education. It goes to what, what young people learn about the world. Um, and I do think that, um, and it may be sadly that, um, you know, some of these connect, some of this connection is going to find you <laughs> whether you, you see it or not. Um, just the examples I'm giving, you know, this, the genomics, um, you could live in the most isolated place, but if you're going to get medical attention, whatever, 25 years from now, you know, you're likely going to be faced with some of these questions, whether it's for you or your family. Um, you know, you log on online, you're connected. You breathe the air, you're connected. Um, you know, migration, you know, and so on, you know, we, you know, it, it, so it's, it's going to find you, um, even if you're not, completely aware of it. So, but, you yeah. know, yeah. we see, we, we thought that the internet was going to connect us. Yeah. It's and divided instead it us. tribalized us. Yeah. Or it seems to have tried. I, yeah. I mean, it connected some, again, it connected some people, perhaps. Yeah. And it tribalized other people. Yeah. So, uh, this is a good, you know, I'm just, you know, the way I, the way I answer this question is, I think sometimes ethics, you know, when, when you approach it, especially ethics in international affairs, there's, there's this kind of assumption that what we're talking about is some kind of global comity where everybody gets along and we're actually kind of thinking the same. And, and um, you know, I think that's, that's actually not what we're, what we're aiming for. We're actually aiming for living with differences. And, in fact, I think difference is good, right? Um, the question is, how do you live with difference in a positive way and not in a negative way? And um, I am a, um, a, a proponent of the, the, the sort of key ethics principle for me is pluralism. And what do I mean by pluralism? Pluralism, 
pluralism has in the center that we're all human beings. And there's something elemental about and common in the human experience. But basically, the rest of life is about differences. And actually, differences are good, but the question is, how do you manage difference? How do you live with difference? And the, the problems that I was laying out or challenges are these are things that just need to be dealt with collectively in some way. And that's why it's so difficult. You know, how do we manage differences but also get some coordinating principles around these really hard, these really hard questions? But the, 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 the main thing for me is, again, especially on these technology things, is that if ethics... If pluralism, if that, if that element, you know, keeping the human values at the center, otherwise the technology and other things will just overwhelm us. Sorry. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I was just wondering how you deal with. Um, people who lack and the inequality. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people were sitting here in that's kind of wrong. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there in Brattleboro mm -hmm. on the street. And how do you deal with that over a period of time? I think that's a, that's kind of starts in a, in a Personal, it's a very personal kind of thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you've raised a profound ethical principle, and it goes to the um, the equal moral worth of every human being. I mean, I think that that's part of what I'm trying to express as being central to when I say ethics. What it, what is it that I'm talking about? And when I talk about democracy, what is it that we're talking about? It's that everybody has a voice. Everybody has equal standing, right? Um, and that's you know that's that's the process. And I think a big question for uh, for those of us who are concerned about ethics is, you're right. How do we how do we address that issue? We talked about this in, in class today about uh, you know inequalities and how do we how do we, we deal with this? And I think the challenge is to find a way to maximize the, 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 the opportunity for every person to reach their full potential. I mean, that, in, in the sense, that's, that's the heart of the, of the challenge. If I had, the, if I had the, the, the mechanical answer to do that, I would, I would, I would offer it to you. But I do think that um, there are, we do, you know, where I would counsel is, you know, what has worked in the past. Um, I tend to think that uh, history is mixed. Um, it's, there's, not a, there's not a linear progression forward or, um, or backward or whatever. I think, I think it's mixed. But I do think we have some good models to, to look at. And... Um, um, I don't think we're starting from, from zero on that. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. I just had the experience of being in Abu Dhabi at the end of the Special Olympics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to... I think we don't always see. We see all the bad stuff that doesn't rise. Right. And, you know, I, I had no previous experience. I mean, I've worked in education, had special education, IEPs, da-da-da. But until you experience something like the Special Olympics that Eunice Shriver created, you, you have no idea the, of the, um, yeah, of the recognition of that humanity and, and these it was just an incredible experience. Find yourself crying at the closing ceremony of the Special Olympics because all of these people, according to Tim Shriver, are the people who are determined to live their lives at the best level. That they can. No, that's a great example, and I, and I appreciate the emotion in that because I think that that's important, and I think you're right. 
we do tend to um, overlook sometimes the these positive stories and the successes. Um, not to make everything academic, but some of this stuff has been put into into sort of academic form in terms of you know the the capacities for human progress from an ethical perspective, from a humanistic perspective, expanding rights, um, norms that have changed in, in, a, in a more inclusive, expanding direction. Just to give you one example, the work of Steven Pinker, who's written a book called Enlightenment Now, and also The Better Angels of Our Nature. He explains, you know, in global history, you know, we're actually doing better, you know, there's less violent death, less cruelty, you know, you know, we don't, you know, just, it's amazing the examples he uses, we treat animals better, not, you know, and not that, again, not that the journey's complete, but that, you know, we can see, you know, kind of some progress, and I think especially when we talk to younger people, it's, it's easy to slip into a tale of woe and all these kinds of places we're coming up short, which is true, but um, again, I do think we do have some positive examples of um, sort of humanistic achievement if you will, that I think are important. And we probably need to channel that a little bit more. And again, I'm not sure how the best way to do that is. Um, you know, as they say, you teach what you know, and what I know is education. And so that's where I sort of go to is my, <laughs> is my fix. But I think you can have tremendous effects by working this kind of message into the intellectual formation of young people. And so that that becomes normative for them. That becomes expected, understood, as opposed to something either extraordinary or not, or you're not able to do. So, yeah. Are you talking about yeah. responsibility? Absolutely. I think that, um, I think responsibility, I mean, I think that's a big... Well, that's what's not being shown today is responsibility. Yeah. So my view on that is I, I think that's that's a very profound point. <clears throat> Everybody talks about rights and very few people talk about responsibilities. And um, I think the two things go together. I think that... Well, if you don't have the higher generation passing it down, show them or tell them this should be picked up. It yeah. becomes a days ago and it is a continue. Yeah. Well, I think that's um, <clears throat> a concern about what's being demonstrated in our society right now. There is sort of a corrosive effect of um, people who either are not held accountable or not held responsible for, um, for what they're saying and doing. And uh, I think that's, again, an important part of an ethical society, which is responsibility and accountability for your actions. Yes, sir. Um, sorry. I guess I'm interested in the idea of um, uh, who in ethics you describe some of the issues that are being that are going to come to us mm -hmm. and who is going to make decisions about them and who's not and uh how how to address the issue of complicated the complications of these things and the simple part right because people are like oh that's right and that's wrong right that's so um that that's what I'm, you know. How how are these issues going to be? I mean, you you mentioned democracy yeah. as a way to address them. Uh, so, for example, the genome part of it, for example, mm -hmm. how are those issues going to be described, uh, dis decided, or who's going to decide them? Yeah, great question. I think that um, first of all, the um, I think leadership is very important, especially on some of these technological issues. So, for example, on the, on, the, on the genome question, I think people in places of authority, um, in the scientific community, in the health community, in the funding community, right? I mean, it's sort of a joint effort in terms of how they're going to set the standards for, you know, what is permissible or what is not in the institutions that they lead. That's not to say that everything will be top down because I think institutions are responsive to their constituencies, but I think you know realistically that's how these things are gonna um, 
work themselves out. It's funny, I've, I've really come a long way when I sort of started out in this business. I was sort of anti-institutionalist, I was, you know, and you realize the power of institutions and the power of the leadership of those institutions to set norms and standards and hold people accountable and so on. So I think that's important. The other part of your question, though, I think is, 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 is also that these are not questions that are asked and answered in a single way. You know, often it's sort of to and fro and one, one way and another, and you will kind of work your way towards towards an outcome. Um, you know, again, I think ethics sometimes is, is, is thought of in too simple a way, which is, you know, okay, we, 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 made a, we made a decision, but anybody who studied decision theory, you know that, you know, you make a decision and then what happens next? Well, there's another decision, right? You know, you get up to the top of the hill and it's like, okay, you know, next hill, right? So it's a process, it's an iterative process, and it's not always linear. Um, Yeah. Here in southern Vermont, the breakdown in ethics is found in two serious casualties in our lives. One is domestic violence, mm -hmm. and the other is the opioid crisis. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Oh, no, I don't. I, 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 that, was, was that, that was a comment. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I had uh, sort of a, a, a practical question. Yeah. Um, you fed my my um, passion for international relations and to some extent theology as well. Um, uh, but I got my PhD in history, so mm -hmm. I want to ask you a historical question. Can you provide an example of a society that sort of lost its moral and ethical um, way and sort of came right. And, and what might that process be? And the reason why I ask that is because I sense that in our own country we have ceased to be a, either a meritocracy or a moraltocracy. I, I think we've lost our moral and ethical way simply looking at our leadership, and I'll just leave it at that. How does a society come back from going wayward? Is there a specific historical example that wow. can give us some hope? Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, the, probably the, you know, thank you, thank you. No, right, so. So thank you. You're going to give that. I've got a three to four hour ride back to New York tomorrow. And <laughs> that, that's a great question that I should. Need that historical example. Yeah, I mean, I think the the stock answer is, and this is, I need to think more about this. It's a great question. I mean, go back to the Peloponnesian War or whatever. But, <laughs> but no, but the stock answer is Europe. And I, I mean, just to think about Europe for a second, because it's 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 something that everybody understands and. Um, and right, I mean, it, it, it was a completely destructive war, but the, um, I, I think we cannot underestimate the reconciliation of Europe in, 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 you know, within, within our lives. And um, I remember running into a gentleman, <clears throat> I, was, I happened to be in France in 2002. In 2002 was when Europe went on to the Euro. And I happened to be there and I ran into a gentleman who was then in his 70s. And I said, <clears throat> you know, what do you think of the euro? He's like, you know, I'm still thinking in francs, you know, and this is this is hard. He says, but it's it's the right thing, and and I, you know, so I said, what do you, you know, what do you think about the EU, you know, the this this project? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, what do you mean? He said, this is this means no more war in Europe. And again, such a simple point, but such a profound point, and hard for us to imagine you know, what, what that really meant to the people who lived through that century and the fact that where we are now. So that gives me some hope that, you know, that reconciliation of that kind is, is possible, but I know that that's not, a, that's not a direct answer to your question. Let me share. Yes, please. Give an yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, the, I think, closest nationality and country to what you are looking for is ancient Persia 
under Cyrus the Great. This is 500 BC, where he wrote the first Declaration of Human Rights, which is now in the United Nations as the principle of human peace for the world. And he did that, he wrote it, he explained it, and he acted. The first action he did was free the Jews from Babylon and financed and moved them to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple for them. Then he announced that every nationality, every nation, every tribe is free to exercise their religion, their culture, and their tradition, and made that worldwide in the great empire. And that went on for generation after generation until Darius the Great, and those from 500 BC to 5 AD, was about 1,000 years, were international love, peace, understanding of all cultures and religion was exercised all over. I think that is the closest can be to a nation. Unfortunately, that has changed, but there you are. Uh, you have another question back there. I bring you the... Thank you. Uh, do, do you know who Dan DeWalt is? No, I'm, I'm asking. I'm sorry, the name again, please? Dan DeWalt. I do not. It's, it's obvious you don't read Time magazine. <laughs> uh, about 19 years ago, he uh, proposed to the town meeting in New Fane the impeachment of George Bush. It made the uh, cover of Time magazine, mm -hmm. Time magazine at that time. Dan DeWalt today wrote a lovely article in The Reformer uh, about uh, what's happened since the war, of, uh, the Afghan war, mm -hmm. and he used words about the soul of America. It so happened that um, I opened up my computer and uh, there's a letter, a uh, newsletter from the, 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 from our parent organization, mm -hmm. um, and the, the World Affairs Council of America. And they had four very interesting articles, very relevant to what you've spoken about. <clears throat> the first article was lamenting the eight or ten vacancies in the cabinet in the government of Mr. Trump. The second article was on Netanyahu's victory. The third article was on Modi's upcoming victory in India. Mm -hmm. The fourth article was on Britain and Brexit. So you've got the four great democracies of the world, all in a shambles. Mm -hmm. And there's an article down there about India by someone I'm sure whom you met, Shashi Tharoor. I know Shashi, yeah. Shashi had a line, headline on his article, this election is for the soul of India. <laughs> so you've got two people, both Democrats, the anti walt in the only democratic society left in the world, Southern Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> and the d largest dying democracy in the world, Shashi Tharoor's India. So, I, I was recording, sitting here, listening to you. Lovely, lovely, lovely talk. I, I've got to commend you. I, I'm delighted uh, that you came today to talk here. Just after, the, just after, about the time that the Afghan war began, the U.S.-Afghan war began, I was in your seat talking at Marlborough. And I spoke about Fujiyama mm -hmm. and the end of history and the last man. And for those of you who don't know that, Fujiyama's uh, professor in the US who spoke about the fact that democracy is now universal. And since history is really the process of the evolution of democracy, it's the end of history. 
And my words at Marlborough to Tim Little's class was, I came to the US in the year 1999, wondering at this new world, this new millennium, where there, this was a millennium of universal democracy. And 20 years later now, I'm thinking about this, is it the end of democracy and not of history? Because the situation we're in today, I don't think it's gonna change very quickly. I'm teaching a course on empires and the imperial age right now. And for the past, since Cyrus the Great, I'm glad Esak spoke about him. We have lived in the imperial age. Democracy died very quickly in this country. We are the greatest empire the world has ever known. We're now gonna rule space. And we're not, we're not giving up genomes and virtual reality and the internet, we're gonna use it. We collect information from every single human right. being in this world. So I think, to my mind, I'm wondering about Shashi and Dandy Walt. Great, so let me, just, let me just close on this point, and I'm gonna close, actually I, I really appreciate your experience and your perspective, and what I hear from you is I really do believe our society now is being asked a question. I think we're being asked a question, and I think that it's still within our possibility to answer it. And I'll leave you with this image. <clears throat> it's a little bit, again, <laughs> a little simple, but standing in this room and seeing this beautiful place in this beautiful town, all I could think about is um, the Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms, right? The gentleman standing up, freedom of expression. I believe this was a Vermonter, right? I believe this takes place in Vermont. Southern Vermont. In southern Vermont. I understand there's some issues with Rockwell, but that but you understand <laughs> you understand that. I, I and, and I'm here to tell you, listen, I'm a New England guy, an East Coast guy, I'm an optimist by uh, disposition, but I believe in I believe in that. I believe in that. And I don't think that the question has been answered in the negative, and uh, I think it's up to us. So, thank you.